limitations. We just surrender all those preconceived ideas, Lord. We just come in obedience tonight. Just want to worship you. Above all, we want you to be first. We want to worship you first. Above our worries, above our finances, above our problems, we want to worship you first. We want to recognize, God, that you are faithful in all your ways you are good. You are faithful and in all your ways you are good. We worship you.
crucified, the veil that used to separate us from God. This was not just a, a little see-through curtain. 
This thing was like 11 or inches or more thick of, of different layers of hide and and it was and there was no split in the middle. It, the only way you could get in was to go around, squeeze in through the outsides on, on one on one end to get into the Holy of Holies. But when Jesus was crucified and when all of heaven broke loose and there was earthquakes and there was darkness and there was an eclipse actually happening at the time and, and there was just all these things, everybody was terrified. That, that that veil that had been that curtain between that had been there from the from the very first temple that they had in the wilderness in a tent was was torn, was ripped in two from top to bottom. There was that something, it wasn't anything there that ripped it in half. It just was it was a symbolic message that God's saying, You are now in eternity, you are now a kingdom being having a kingdom experience. You are now, you now have full access to me. And your sin no longer separates you from me. And there is no longer anything that can keep me from loving you. There's nothing that can keep you from my love. There's nothing, there's no wrong you can do. There's no sin that you can commit that, that cannot keep me from loving you. Cannot. cannot keep us. He wanted us to draw near to him. So close. So close. So close we can hear his heartbeat. So close we can feel his breath. So close it's, he's a whisper away. He's a whisper away. And he did it all for you. Say that he did it all for me. Say that he did it all for me. He did it all for me. Because he loved me. Because he loved me.
David was king before he killed Goliath before anyone knew anything about him he was a boy and he was an illegitimate child because he was not from Jesse's first wife. And so David was an outcast. A 
and he was sent out to the fields to tend the sheep. Basically, that was, we don't want to see you. We don't want to put up with you. Go watch sheep. So David was kind of on his own. Probably had some pretty big abandonment issues. Had some pretty big identity issues. As a young boy, just fending for himself out in the wilderness, tending sheep. And in that place, he got to know God. And God allowed himself to, to, to be seen by David through this relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. We used to raise sheep. We, used to, we will raise them again someday. But for many years, uh, we raised sheep. And... Uh, I began to understand why God related us to sheep quite often because um, sheep can be really dumb. <laughs> and, and there's been more than once when 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 I, all I want the sheep to do is go in the pen. That's all I want it to do. And it's, that is the only thing it won't do. I just want it to go in the pen. The door is open. There's hay in there. There's fresh water in there. The dumb sheep won't go in. No, it would rather mow me over or dive out of the way or do anything and everything to not do what I'm trying to get it to do. But at the same time, there's also moments where you're tending the sheep, either, either you're nursing a sick sheep or, or our favorite season was lambing season. The precious, pure lambs, just white as snow and, and just getting to watch them. And so every now and then we would have bummer lambs that my kids would get to bottle feed and they were like little dogs. They would just follow you everywhere and I think we even had a couple of them live inside the house for a little while. For a little while. But David got this picture of, of God through as a shepherd. And as he became king, um, I believe that he saw the same relationship between the way that he shepherded sheep and the way that he ruled people. And and uh, there was a, a brotherhood of men. They were called David's mighty men. That I believe David shepherded well. The, these men would lay down their life for David. Whatever he said, they would do. On yesterday morning, we read the 23rd Psalm and, we, and he gives this picture of of the shepherd and the sheep. And God as the shepherd taking us to, and, and he's trying to say, I've got these green pastures and I've got these peaceful waters and I want you to go there. I want to take you there. I'm leading you there. And sometimes we just choose to run the other way because we're like a sheep sometimes. some versions it says he makes me to lie down in green pastures sometimes we're running and he grabs us and says no be still know that I'm God just stay right here I'm just thinking about this picture and the preciousness and how valuable and there were many times at night, you know, in the middle of the night, we'd have a lamb or, or a, a ewe that was having lambs and we'd be out helping her or with the labor or whatever we needed to do in the middle of the night, tending to the sheep, taking care of them, nursing them, whatever we needed to do, helping the babies get hooked up if they were premature and, and different things like that. So God tends for us the same way and he longs for us to have the closeness, to know his voice that as sheep, Jesus says my sheep know my voice and the, they will not listen to the voice of another so we learn to listen to our shepherd, we learn to listen to what he has to say and David, the king held on to this picture of 
the relationship of God and us and Him being our shepherd. Tonight I want to read from the 24th Psalm and, uh, and look at some of the imagery and things that we get here. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to Him. For He laid the earth's foundations on the seas and built it on the ocean's depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure and do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have right relationship with God their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship you in your presence, O God of Jacob. This was before this was before Jesus came and, and it's Jesus' righteousness and what Jesus did on the cross that now makes us righteous and pure and holy to come into the presence. This is why the veil is torn in two now. There had to be a veil before. There doesn't now because of the blood of Jesus. Because of what, he, what he's done. God gave me a song, I don't know, probably a little over a year ago from this next section in, in, uh, in this song. It says, open up ancient gates. Open up ancient doors and let the King of Glory enter. Who is the King of Glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates. Open up ancient doors and let the King of Glory enter. Who is the King of Glory? The Lord of Heaven's armies. He is the King of Glory. And we get to come and worship because He has made our hands and our hearts pure and He has made it so that we can be in right standing with Him through His grace and mercy. After this next song, David has uh, something to share uh, with us tonight because we're going to enter into communion tonight um, and and he felt really strongly to really look at why do we take communion? What is the point? How does that um, pertain to uh, our place and, and, and worship? Why do we do it every day? What does it represent? And I mean, we know that Jesus did it, but is there something more to that? So I'll have David come up after we sing this next song.
take her in your arm. That she would just feel your loving arms, your hands, that she would be in your presence, that she would just be in complete peace, in complete and utter peace in your presence, God. And that you would bring a sense of comfort and bring your comfort, God, to Carol as she helps her friend graduate. So we just declare that in you, death has no victory, death has no sting. In you, God, we are more than conquerors and we are victorious. And at the end of this adventure that we are on with you, you welcome us home saying, well done, good and faithful servant. You fought the fight. You ran the race. Let's party. Who do you think invented parties, guys? (laughs) God knows how to get down. God knows how to party. God knows. My goodness, his first miracle was turning water to wine. Come on. (laughs) He knows how to party. So God, we just celebrate the life of Diana. We celebrate all that you're doing. We celebrate, Lord, those who have gone on before us. And we pray, Lord, that we would be people that would that would view death through your eyes. That we would be able to see your grace and your mercy, your justice, your sovereignty, your holiness in, in the face of death. Even, even unjust death in, in our eyes. Even when we see children suffering and dying. Even when we see those whose years were cut short, God, that we would still trust your ways trust your view and take hold of your view about it. And Lord, we want to take your view right now of your death, Jesus. Of your death on the cross. Go ahead, David. So we'll wait to partake until uh, afterwards and Victoria, we'll go together. Hi. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, we do communion down here every time we come down here to worship, and uh, I never really understood completely what it was about, you know what I'm saying? I heard people talking about her or whatever, but I wasn't really getting it. So uh, last night when I was reading in the Bible, I, in Matthew, I read about the Lord's Supper, and that's what it's, this is what it's about. So I want to read this to you so that everybody, you know, can, you know that don't understand will be able to understand this better. During the during the meal that Jesus took some bread in his hands, he blessed the bread and then he broke it. Then he gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and eat it. This is my body. That's the bread. Jesus picked up a cup of wine and gave thanks to God. He then gave it to his disciples and said, Take this. Take this. Take, uh, uh, Jesus picked up a cup of wine and gave thanks to God. He then gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and drink it. This is my blood. This is uh, this is my blood, and with it, God makes an agreement with you. It will be poured out so that many people will have their sins forgiven. From now on, I am not going to drink any wine until I drink new wine with you in my Father's kingdom. Then he sang him and went out to the mountain house. So that's what this is about. Yeah, yeah. I'd just like to do that tonight with you guys. So this is the body of Christ. I'm going to break it just like he did with his disciples. And he blessed it. And he blessed it. So we bless this in the name of Jesus. This is your body broken for us, Jesus. This is the bread of life. The bread of your presence. And we thank you, Lord, for all that your body.
body accomplished because it was the breaking of his body that brought us healing. Yeah. Amen. It was the breaking of his body that brought us healing. Yeah. Physical, emotional, brought us healing. Amen. Amen. Yes. And then we drink the cup of blood. Blessing. We bless it again. Bless it again. <laughs> Lord, yeah. we bless this cup. Yeah. And we thank you yeah. for the blood that was spilt, and we recognize that this blood washes us whiter than snow. Amen. That we are renewed, we are made right and holy. Yes. We are no longer, well, I'm going to do a little triumph over trauma. We're no longer a worm living a worm life <laughs> with a worm destiny. We are now a new creation in Christ Jesus. Yes. And we're butterflies. <laughs> Transformation. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. If you have not attended the Triumph Over Trauma, we're going to be having one in July here in Northburg. Okay. And we want to encourage you to come. Even if you've come before, come again. It will bless you. I'm going to go. That's fine. Thank you. Yep, thank you. I actually want to tag on to the end of what you had to share here. Me too. Out of John chapter 6, uh, we read earlier this week that this was probably one of Jesus' most offensive uh, sermons he ever preached. But I'm gonna, it's uh, John chapter 6, and Jesus is trying to describe to his disciples and tell those people around him. He's actually talking to the 5,000 that were fed, and it was actually closer to 15,000. Um, I'm going to start in verse 35. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me even though you've seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. Then the people began to murmur in disagreement because of what he said. I am the bread that came down from heaven, they said. Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say that he came down from heaven? But Jesus replied, Stop complaining about what I said. For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day I will raise them up. As it is written in the scriptures, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns of him comes to him. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I who was sent from God have seen him. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. There's the view, different view about death because of Jesus. We're just moving from glory to glory, folks. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer, so the world, uh, and this bread, which I offer, so the world may live, is my flesh. Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They asked. Sounds like cannibalism. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot and have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me in the same way. Anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread. How many times has he said that? I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did. 
even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. They couldn't accept this. Now, did Jesus literally have people eat his body and drink his blood? No. This was a kingdom perspective that he was trying to get them to grasp. But they were so caught up in the reality of what he was asking them to do that they couldn't see the kingdom picture. They couldn't see the, the vision that Jesus was painting before them. That, they, that we partake, Romans 6 says, that we are crucified with Christ. We are buried with Christ. We resurrect with Christ. This is an invitation to partake just like what we just did. This is an invitation to partake and participate in his death, burial, and resurrection. And we, he's invited us into this place to be a part of what he did to save the world. So every time we take communion, it is not just a flippant thing that we do. It's not because we're really hungry, because this isn't really sustenance. This is a, a symbolic about what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross for us. Right. Amen. Amen. So what a pleasure it is that we get to do this with complete freedom. Because there are those that would be in trouble for doing what we just did. Yeah. <laughs> So when David said uh, about the Lord saying that uh, this is my blood and that I will never drink wine, he's actually making a blood covenant with us right. about how we worship him and that we, that we are in a community. Might also <clears throat> tell them that we're supposed to do this as often as, as we need. often as we need. That's why we do it every day. Because yep. Jesus told us to. Forever my love, forever my love. 
about it and it won't do what I tell it to do. I just want to pray that all anxiety will end. So God, we just thank you for this opportunity. And just pray for all anxiety to go over every person, for every situation. We thank you, Lord, for the joy and the opportunities. And we just pray for Caitlin and this opportunity tomorrow that she would just trust you. And it would be another way for you to reveal yourself to her through her opportunities and circumstances and the blessings that you put on her. And we just agree with you about her and her position in the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Be blessed. Let's have a great night. Come on, you got to give a commercial here. <laughs> You have to give a commercial now. Oh, okay. So, so there is a reception at Gallery Northwest. It is next Friday evening from 5 until 7.30. And it is located at 625 Southeast Jackson Street in Roseburg, Oregon. And these are some of my portraits that will be there. Oh, wow. That's, that's pretty close to Thai Treasures. That's what? Close to Thai Treasures. And Thai Treasures is 650. Okay. I would love for you to come.